Hello and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IAS. I welcome you all to today's explained session. It's Friday, it's 8 p.m. means it's time once again for our weekly explained series. As you know, in the explained session, we bring to you some of the most important topics that have remained in the news, especially from the UPSC examination point of view. Now, if you have been reading the news in the last week or so, you also know the one news that has actually topped above everything else is the recent Supreme Court judgment with respect to the EWS reservation. That is a 10% reservation given to the economically weaker section of the society in India. Ever since the reservation came into being in 2019, there have been a lot of questions asked about this reservation. Finally, the Supreme Court of India has put all those questions at rest by actually deciding on all those matters one by one. In this session of The Explain today, we will be discussing about the history of the EWS reservation in India, what are the merits behind it, why did the government introduce this, and also, especially, what did the Supreme Court say in its EWS reservation judgment. So without any further delay, let's begin the session that we have at our hand. Now, as you know, the reason why we are discussing this is because a constitutional bench in the Supreme Court has upheld the EWS quota. Now, when I say a constitutional bench, that means a bench of five Supreme Court judges was hearing this matter and there was a split judgment that is 3-2, meaning that while three judges actually decided to uphold the quota, the other two were actually against this idea of EWS reservation. And most notably, Amongst these two judges was also the Chief Justice of India at that time, that is Justice U. U. Lalit. This also goes to show that in the Supreme Court, while deciding any verdict, the majority rule wins. It doesn't matter who are the judges on either side. Even if the senior most judges, including the Chief Justice of India, are on the minority side, it is still the majority side whose decision will be considered as final. This is what has happened in this case as well. Now. In order to understand the EWS reservation issue, you have to understand the different questions that were surrounding it. There were multiple questions asked about the EWS reservation which the Supreme Court had to answer. For example, number one, they had to decide whether or not is it constitutional or unconstitutional to have EWS reservation. The reason being that if you look at the original copy of the Constitution of India, the original constitution only allowed reservation on the basis of social or education backwardness. The original constitution never mentioned anything about the economic backwardness being a criteria for giving reservation to anyone. Secondly, even if EWS reservation is granted, would it only be for the unreserved category? Meaning that what about those people who belong to SC, ST or OBC category but are still economically weaker? Would you not include them or would you include them here? This was also a big, big question that had to be answered. The third question here was, what about the 50% limit that has been set by the Supreme Court itself? As you know, in 1992, in the Indra Sani case, the Supreme Court had said that the total reservation should not exceed 50% except in exceptional circumstances. Now, as you know, the current reservation that we have, I'm not counting the physically disabled reservation. If you look at the caste-based reservation that we have at present, scheduled caste 15%, scheduled tribe 7.5%, OBC 27%. This all makes up 49.5% reservation. And now if you add 10% EWS reservation to it, it goes way, way beyond the 50% limit that has been set by the Supreme Court. In that aspect also, should this EWS reservation be allowed or not? These were the major questions that the Supreme Court had to answer and they have answered all of these and we will be discussing these answers one by one. Now, as you know, if you go back to how and where did it all start? It all started with the 103rd Constitutional Amendment of 2019. Now, the reason why the government of India had to amend the constitution for this is, as I said earlier, if you look at the original provisions of the constitution, 
the original pro provisions of the constitution only allowed the state to make special provisions in favor of those who are socially or educationally backward means there was no provision to have any special provisions for those who are economically backward article 15 and article 16 both of these had to be amended if you take even a step back here i would like to remind you in 1990s there was one more government that tried to do the same thing after the vp singh government had implemented the mandal commission recommendation and had given reservation to the obc the pv narsimha rao government that is a congress government they also wanted to do something similar pv narsimha rao when he was a prime minister his government had announced that we will give 10% reservation to EWS, very similar to what is a provision now. However, in the Indra Sani case, it was struck down. The reason being that it was done through an executive order. The constitution was not amended because it did not have the required majority. The Supreme Court said that the constitution does not allow reservation on the basis of economic backwardness. That is why the present government realizing this, they first amended the constitution by 103rd amendment act and then they said that we are now offering 10% EWS reservation. That is why it has been upheld even today. The Supreme Court said that this 103rd amendment act does not breach the basic structure of the Indian constitution. As you know, ever since the Keshwananda Bharti case, we have the doctrine of basic structure under which no constitutional amendment shall be allowed to alter the basic structure of the Indian constitution. What is the basic structure? That shall be decided by the Supreme Court. It is their prerogative to decide what is the basic structure and what violates the basic structure and what does not. Thus, they said that giving EWS reservation is not a violation of the basic structure of the constitution and also Reservation in addition to the existing reservations also do not violate any provision of the constitution because now the constitution does allow for special provisions in favor of economic backwardness as well. They also said that this is actually an instrument of affirmative action. Affirmative action again is a phrase that you should be familiar with in case you don't know. Affirmative action is those policy measures by the government which actually ensures positive discrimination in favor of those who have been discriminated against historically. So, for example, in a country where backward classes, where Dalits have been discriminated against in the past, it becomes the responsibility of the government to have certain provisions which will ensure that they actually get a better deal as compared to the others which ensures that their development takes place at a more rapid pace and they are included in the society. This is called affirmative action. It is not just followed in India. Many other nations, many other governments follow similar kind of provisions. It is usually done in the form of reservation only. Reservation for those people who are socially educationally backwards. Reservation for those who have been discriminated against. Reservation for those who are considered as a son of the soil. That is people who are originally from that particular area. These kind of reservations actually exist in many other parts of the world as well. Affirmative action, in fact, as an ideal has also been propagated by the United Nations as well. So as for the Supreme Court, this falls in line with the idea of affirmative action and we cannot ask the government to take it back. Then the Supreme Court also had to handle the question of 50% limit. The Supreme Court said that the 50% limit is not inflexible. They reiterated what they had said in the famous Indra Sahani case of 1992. As you know, the Indra Sahani case of 1992 was basically against the government's decision of 27% OBC reservation. Indra Sahani herself was a journalist. She was the one who filed case on behalf of students belonging to the unreserved category who were protesting all across the country, specifically in Delhi. In this case, the Supreme Court had said that yes, a 50% limit on reservation should be abided by. However, it is not inflexible. That is, it only applies to SC, ST 
socially, educationally backward classes and other backward classes. In other words, this 50% limit as per the Supreme Court was only supposed to be for caste based reservation. Supreme Court says that any reservation that is not given on the basis of caste as is the case with the EWS reservation, this will be over and above the 50% limit. So they answered that question as well. Now, this was the view of the majority of the judges. That is, in the three used to do judgment, three judges abided by that view. Now, what was the minority view? What did the other two judges, including the Chief Justice of India, had to say? They said that the more you increase reservation, the lesser beneficial it would be. They said that if we have reservation on economic criteria as well, that means those who already have reservation benefits, SC, ST, OBC, that would be an injustice to them because their share of the pie will reduce drastically. They also said that the EWS quota may have actually created a level playing field, but with the exclusion of SC, ST, OBC, it also goes against the concept of equality. They say that the entire idea was to help those who are economically backward, then why to exclude those who are among scheduled castes, scheduled tribes or OBC and are still economically backward? They deserve as much help from the government as those who are unreserved and are economically backward. Also, the minority view of the bench said that the 50% limit should not be breached like this. Because they said that if you allow this to happen now, you are giving almost a free hand to the government of center and the state to bring in reservation for any kind. In fact, this view has been reiterated by many people who have criticized the Supreme Court judgment. In fact, just a couple of days back in the Hindu newspaper, there was an editorial written by Shashi Tharoor, where he also argued exactly the same. He said that if you look back at the earlier Supreme Court judgments about reservation, especially the Supreme Court judgment about exclusion of Jats. As you know, the Congress government had actually excluded the Jats in the OBC list, which was later reversed by the Supreme Court in 2015. In 2015, when the Supreme Court had heard this matter, they had specifically said that the government, in order to give reservation to any class of citizens, must have adequate proof of how they would determine those people who actually require reservation benefits. It cannot be random. The government cannot just pick and choose those people who they consider as a vote bank. Also, just because a class of citizens consider themselves as backward doesn't mean that they should get reservation from the government. There has to be a proper study conducted based on empirical facts and only and only then these decisions should be taken. As for Shashi Tharoor, this decision of the Supreme Court of India will open up a Pandora box and we might see a lot of other demands of reservation, not just at the center, but at the state government level as well. Now, before I go further, I also wanted to discuss with you the concept of horizontal and vertical reservation and how does it apply here. Now, if you see the entire debate of whether or not there should be EWS category within SC, ST, OBC as well, that can be understood from horizontal versus vertical reservation. Let's try and understand this. This is vertical reservation. So for example, the government of India has reserved certain seats for scheduled caste. They have reserved certain seats for scheduled tribes. And then they said we are reserving certain seats for OBC as well. These are mutually exclusive of each other. When I say mutually exclusive of each other, that means no single person can claim that I am an OBC also and I am a scheduled tribe also. That is why these are vertical reservations. These are mutually exclusive. Now, when you bring in horizontal reservation, an idea of horizontal reservation can be, let's assume we say that we are providing women reservation as well. Now, women reservation, if you follow up that idea, there will be women amongst OBC also. There will be women amongst SC also. There will be women amongst ST also. 
So, women reservation, if it is provided horizontally, it will be something like this. There will be group of people who will be women also and who will be scheduled tribes also or scheduled caste also or other backward classes also. This becomes horizontal reservation. Similarly is the question for EWS. Will the EWS category be something like this mutually exclusive of the other caste groups or will it be horizontal reservation something like this where SC, ST, OBC will also be included. The Supreme Court has actually said it will be vertical reservation exclusive of other classes. That is why this will only be applicable to those who belong to the unreserved category. The confusion in the other case would be, let's assume there is a candidate who belongs to EWS category and also one of the other backward classes. Then if that candidate gets a seat, Will that seat be counted as an EWS seat or an OBC seat? Or if it is counted as one, what seat would you fill up first? Would the EWS seat be filled up first or would the OBC seat be filled up first? When you ensure vertical reservation, that is much, much easier to implement. On the other hand, when you go ahead with horizontal reservation, you would then have to give a lot of important provisions of how would that reservation be followed and how would that be implemented? Which seed would be filled first? Which seed would come second? How will you count? All that actually becomes extremely, extremely significant. This is where the government had to take a very, very tough call. If you provide horizontal reservation, then you have to ensure that the target audience which you wanted to benefit is actually getting the benefit. But now the Supreme Court has said it will be a vertical reservation. So all these reservations will be mutually exclusive from each other. Now the EWS criteria, that is the economically weaker section quota, as we discussed, this came into being by 103rd Constitutional Amendment Act in 2019 by amending Articles 15 and 16 and including additional provisions for economic reservation in jobs and admission to education institutions. Now, there have been multiple questions asked apart from what we have discussed. One big question that has been asked is, how did the government decide who will be considered as economically weaker and who will not be considered as economically weaker? The government of India has come up with certain criteria, which is right now in front of you. As per the government, you can avail the 10% EWS reservation if you fulfill these. Number one, your household income is less than rupees 8 lakh a year. Then, agricultural land of less than 5 acres, house smaller than 1000 square feet, residential plot less than 100 yards in a municipality, or residential plot less than 200 yards in a non-notified municipality. In these provisions also, Provision number one is where there has been a lot of debate and discussion. Why? Because the Supreme Court has asked the government time and time again. Tell us how exactly did you come at the 8 lakh per year income limit? How is it that you decide this? The government of India has not given any concrete reason behind this. The government of India has said that we have talked to multiple experts, we have conducted multiple surveys, but the reality is huge, huge number of India's population would actually fall under this criteria of earning less than 8 lakh rupees per year as a family income. The problem with this is if you have so many people who would qualify under this criteria, that means you are actually reducing the benefits of reservation because at the end of the day, the lesser people who are competing in that particular group, more are the chances of some of them getting those benefits. The government of India so far has not given any concrete argument in favor of how exactly did they calculate the 8 lakh per year limit to decide who will be in the EWS category or not. The Supreme Court is not happy with this and many critics of the government are saying that this is a random number that the government has arrived at. Now, this EWS reservation has both pros and cons. 
There are people on both sides of the aisle, some appreciating the government's decision and some others criticizing it. Those who appreciate it, according to them, this will help in addressing inequality. They are saying this is the first time ever that unreserved category has something to look forward to. Ever since the reservation has been applied in India, especially with the introduction of the OBC reservation, we have seen a large number of protests breaking out, especially from those who belong to the unreserved category. Now, for the first time ever, they would also have something to look forward to, at least amongst those who are economically weak. It recognizes economic backwardness because there has been a feeling amongst some people that those belonging to scheduled cars, scheduled tribes, but are financially very rich. Assuming those people who have taken up government jobs at high positions due to reservations, they don't really need reservation anymore. But those who belong to the general category but are still economically backward should be getting help from the government. It will also reduce caste-based discrimination because as you know so far, people who did not support reservation criticized those who actually availed it. This led to a lot of caste-based reservation and caste-based discrimination in India. Now, since those who belong to the unreserved category would also take reservation benefits, at least this taboo of reservation would go away from the minds of a lot of people in the society. On the other hand, there are concerns and rightly so. The biggest concern is unavailability of data. There is no clear answer from the government how many families in the entire country or how many individuals in India would fall under this criteria of 8 lakh or below or any of the other criteria for that matter. If you look at how SC, ST or OBC reservation came into being, they were all on the basis of certain data. SC, ST reservation is based on the population patterns of India. OBC reservation also was based on the Mandal Commission report. Yes, many people don't agree with that report. Many people say they use a very old census. All that is agreed. But still, those decisions were based on data where the government did have an idea how many people would fall under this bracket. On the other hand, the OBC reservation, on the other hand, the EWS reservation here does not really seem to be backed up by any concrete data. Thus, it seems to be more arbitrary than thought out. Even when the Supreme Court has questioned the government repeatedly on the 8 lakh limit, they have not been able to come up with any good answer. The other problem here is, India is such a diverse country that you cannot really have one specific criteria that is followed across the country. Let's take an example of certain states. In Goa, the per capita income is almost 4 lakh rupees. At the same time, in Bihar, the per capita income is 40,000. How can you have similar kind of reservation criteria economically for all these states who are so far from each other when it comes to how exactly is the life of the people living in those states? These are some of the questions which have still remained unanswered by the government of India. Now, as I said, the Supreme Court had to answer multiple questions. Four major questions were answered. Let's take them one by one. First question, can there be quotas based on economic criteria alone? The Supreme Court said yes. Poverty is an adequate representation of deprivation. Just caste or social or, edu or educational backwardness cannot be considered as the only criteria which leaves people in a disadvantaged position. Even economic backwardness or poverty is enough of a criteria. They also said that separate reservations are not barred by the constitution. For example, right to education puts obligation on the state to give free and compulsory education. That can also be considered as a form of reservation. Second question that the Supreme Court answered was, is exclusion of SCST, social education backward classes from quota discriminatory means should the EWS within these category also be given reservation is it discriminatory Supreme Court said no it is not discriminatory 
There cannot be any competition of claims for affirmative action based on disadvantages and the government has already been working on reservation for them. So they already have enough skin in the game and they already have enough benefits from the side of the government. Third question that the Supreme Court had to answer. Can the quota for poor breeze a 50% ceiling for reservation? They said yes. Why? Because a 50% quota as per the Supreme Court's understanding is caste based reservation. While the 10% reservation for EWS is not caste based and that is why this ceiling limit should not be applied here. Also, this 50% limit is not inflexible. It is flexible and depending upon how and what kind of conditions exist in the society, they can actually change. Now, this interestingly brought a lot of different reactions from political parties across the country. In fact, many state governments commented that we are happy with this because this also gives us an exception that now we will also bring in more reservation so that this 50% limit is not our concern. Now it remains to be seen what happens because just a few months back you have seen how Maratha reservation was struck down because the Supreme Court said no in Maharashtra Maratha reservation can't be given it is going beyond 50% and you don't have enough studies to prove that they are at a disadvantaged position. So now that Supreme Court has actually broken its own 50% ceiling it remains to be seen how the other states and even the center government abides by that. The fourth question that the Supreme Court had to answer was, can private colleges be forced to have EWS quota? The short answer, yes. The Supreme Court said that the government has the power to make reservations in private education institutions which are unaided in nature as well. They cannot be seen as institutions which are out of the national mainstream. They are a part of the country and thus they also have to abide by these reservation provisions set by the government of India. Now, while these were the major questions that the Supreme Court answered, there was one more point that they touched upon. They touched upon a point which has been a major, major discussion point for many decades now. As you know, when the Constitution of India began its journey, reservation was never supposed to be a permanent feature of the Indian Constitution. It was initially meant to be there for 10 years and then it just kept on increasing and increasing and increasing. However, Supreme Court has said that the government and the Supreme Court have to actually take a call. When exactly is the expiry date of the reservation? The Supreme Court has said that these quota systems cannot live forever. They have to be struck down at a point of time where we believe that all people who actually had to get help from the government have gotten the help and now they are self-sufficient and they can actually sustain in the society. The Supreme Court said that there has to be a time limit fix. Now, the interesting part is this is not the first time that they have said this. They have said this earlier as well. However, it must be said that now the Supreme Court because they have heard a lot of matters of reservation, they do seem to be more serious on this. I would just like to give you a quote from this judgment. The Supreme Court said, framers of the constitution, the framers of the constitution itself actually thought that the reservation benefit would not be long term or would not be permanent. We have completed 75 years of our independence and even then, all the aims and all the benefits of reservation have not properly been passed on. It is now time to think whether or not this policy needs to continue or whether or not we need to put a stop to it. The court said it is an age old caste system in India, but that doesn't really mean that to correct that we can just continue having reservation policy because at the end of the day, we have to create a level playing field. And for many generations of scheduled caste, scheduled tribes, that has already been done. So in order to have an equitable society, in order to have a sustainable society in the long run, we must look beyond reservation in the coming years. They have not set any time frame for this, but they have actually decided that they need to give a push to the government in this regard as well. 
This was the entire idea of the EWS reservation and all the points that were discussed in the Supreme Court regarding this matter. As you know, in Indian polity, reservation has always remained one of the most significant topics and has appeared in the examination time and time again. Thus, I really hope that you do understand all the important and intricate points from this issue. Thank you so much for joining. We'll join you next week, Friday again, 8 p.m. for our next explained session. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for watching.